Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, I am so excited for today's show. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I know it's going to be awesome because we have got an awesome guy here, Brian, here from Mountain Man Medical. Uh, I'm just so glad to have you here, buddy. And uh, just so you guys know, Brian is a uh, combat veteran. He spent some time on the ground in Afghanistan, and uh, he went to EMT school. He worked in the ER, in the military, and uh, he's the director of medical, basically, right, for uh, Mount Man Medical. And uh, we've got some cool stuff to tell you about. We've got some stuff to give away today, too. I really hope that you guys are able to take something away from today's show. Um, uh, Brian and I have been talking, and uh, there's just been some some just awesome conversations, man. And I'm just so glad that you uh, took the time to come on the show and and uh, welcome. Thanks for being here, man. Awesome, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, you know, everybody, I, I want you guys. If you have questions, um, put it into the comments. Brendan's going to be firing those questions at me. Uh, whatever your question is, we'll see if we can get to it. Uh, but most importantly, I think today we're going to talk about some things is, uh, you know, we all, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us here carry a, a firearm every single day, usually to protect ourselves and our family, our loved ones. And, uh, we go to the range, we prepare, we train. And, uh, so if, if that situation occurs where you're at a grocery store or wherever you might be, and you have to actually deploy that and use deadly force, um, you want to be prepared for that and be able to do it efficiently. And I think a lot of times what we are not prepared for, what a lot of people don't think about is um, those situations that occur within a matter of seconds or maybe 10 seconds. And then what occurs post those 10 seconds for the next hour or two or years. And so we're going to cover a little bit of that, what you do as a first responder and, and uh, just kind of pick Brian's brain. So please, if you have questions, please don't hesitate. Ask Brian because uh, he's here for a reason. He's here for you guys. Uh, so Brian, let's talk about a couple of things. Um, number one, uh, you're, let's, let's go to that scenario, right? You are grocery shopping. Something goes down. Um, you, uh, an active shooter is taking place and you have to eliminate that threat. There's been gun, several gunshots you don't know. You just know you had and that. What's the first thing that you're going to do in that situation? Uh, I think uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call 911. Uh, you need police officers and, and paramedics on the way as soon as possible. And um, if the situation dictates you need to get yourself out of that danger zone, um, you need to remove yourself to a safe location and uh, make sure that you and your family are safe first and foremost. That's your primary concern. And then after that, you can give your police report. Um, if the officers ask, you know, why did you leave this scene of a crime? You say, I didn't feel safe. I wanted to go somewhere where I was, I felt safe. Um, and so I think that's one of the most important things. And if you feel like you need to, um, you know, you got to make sure, of course, that you're able to take care of yourself and any loved ones, or maybe even a bystander that's been injured um, and start looking to, to do that. Um, I think uh, one of the primary things that I learned from my experience in the military is that the best battlefield medicine is fire superiority. You need to take care of that threat first before you start working on any of the casualties. So you need to run up and make sure that that threat is eliminated before you start seeing the casualties. Otherwise, that threat's going to continue to make work for you. So take care of the threat first, then see to uh, you know the medical aspect of things, and of course your own personal safety and the safety of your family is priority. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that I think um, can occur, or I know that can occur, is you uh, sometimes once you make yourself safe in the situation safe, you want to look for people who need help, and you may not know that you've been injured. Your adrenaline's been going, that you've been shot or something like that. So uh, it's important to assess yourself as much as you can to make sure that you're equipped enough to take care of somebody else. Um, once you're taken care of, then you can help take care of other. Because if you're not able to take care of other people because of your injury or something, you're not gonna be able to help anyone. So make sure you assess yourself. That's how I've always looked at it. And um, let's let's talk about, um, you know, you see somebody, whether it is um, a chest wound, let's start there. Let's just start with the chest wound. What are, what's your first line of uh, operation when you find somebody who might have a chest wound? Right. So in, 
what I was taught is that from neck to navel, if there's any kind of uh, penetrating trauma to the chest, uh, then you want to immediately expose the wound. You want to find where exactly where that wound is. And then once you do that, usually you'll use uh, your trauma shears or whatever you've got on you to, you know, cut the clothes away so that you can actually see where that penetrating trauma has occurred. Then you're going to take a hand and you're going to place it right over that wound. And again, it's from neck to navel. It doesn't even have to be in the chest. It can be down on the abdomen as well. You place a hand over that wound. And the reason for that is if it is a sucking chest wound, um, then you're going to prevent air from getting into that chest cavity and causing what's called a tension pneumothorax. And one of my favorite uh, movies that really clearly sh depicts this is that movie Three Kings. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, it's got uh, um, Ice Cube and um, a, couple of, a, couple of, a couple other famous actors. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's a pretty popular movie, and in that they show what's occurring during a sucking chest wound and it's a pretty good description now in that particular instance uh the sucking chest wound went from getting shot to life-threatening within a matter of like seconds and in real life it takes a little time for that to build up to the point where it becomes life-threatening so you have a little bit of time in order to take care of that then the other thing you're going to do is you get into your medical kit and you can make your you can get yourself an occlusive dressing a chest seal and what that does is just seals up the wound and prevents air from entering into the chest cavity and building up and then um, then the next thing you want to do is check for an exit wound because you have penetrating trauma especially if it's a gunshot injury you're going to have an entry wound and sometimes not always you're going to have an exit wound so it doesn't do you any good to patch up the entrance and leave the exit completely open to the air where air can enter into the chest cavity. So you want to make sure that you're checking both for an entry and an exit wound. And to do that, a lot of times you'll have to roll the patient over, and take a look at the back of the casualty. Um, if it's a dark setting, then you might not be able to see that. So what I was taught to do is uh, you do a little bear claw and you just rake it down the casualties back and you're trying to find a hole so the idea is is that your hand will your finger will slip into that hole once you find it and then you'll be able to identify where that is at place a hand over it get your chest seal out slap it over and the chest seal you can't really screw it up it's um it's just a a sticky piece of rubber so if they didn't really need that chest seal no big deal um, put it on there anyway and if they get to the hospital and they didn't really need it, the nurses can just take it off. They might lose a little chest hair, but, you know, that's better than the alternative. Right. So that's what I'd do for uh, for a, a chest wound. So I, I want to uh, just let everybody know that we're going to be covering some topics today that um, if you have a weak stomach, maybe you won't like it. Um, but what we're going to be talking about is reality. And when he's talking about raking down someone's back and finding a, a, a hole in someone's back, um, in real life, it's a lot more difficult um, than it is to maybe picture in your head right now, but uh, coming up on some traumatic events or whatever it may be, and I think that that's the other thing we're gonna get into later on in, in the show, is um, what to be prepared for. So uh, we all, not all of us, but we all, there's a sense of wanting to help. You know, you wanna help someone, and um, uh, you know, there, you put yourself in a situation where you're trying to help somebody else, but you might have some side effects, which we'll talk about later. But um, I, I do want to continue to talk about some of this training, though, because I think one of the one of the things that I think um, well, I always talk about when it comes to guns is training. But uh, one thing that we probably don't do enough is uh, talk about training for these type of events. In, when you carry a kit inside your car or your backpack when you're out in the woods or whatever it may be, it's great if you have it. But if you don't know how to use it, it's almost useless, um, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All skills are perishable. Um, this is this is the thing that I know the best. And if I'm not constantly using it and I'm not constantly researching and learning on my own, I, lo I lose it. You know, uh, simple things that I've learned the hard way, I still forget those things. And I have to constantly go back and revisit that stuff and retrain on each one of these topics. 
you know, there's that saying that um, professionals train until they can't get it wrong. And I think that's, you know, you might not be a professional, but I mean, when your life is on the line, you want to be as professional as you can possibly be, especially if it's a loved one that you're trying to help out. So getting that training and constantly revisiting it, I would say at least yearly. Um, in my house, I try to have, uh, we, we have like a family safety night where I, you know, gather everybody together and I try to treat it a little bit like game night where we have some fun with it. It's a family event. It's something where we can all learn a little bit. We go over some self-defense, home defense, fire, and then of course, medical, you know, medical is the thing that, you know, I talk about a lot. So um, I'm going to definitely talk about that and go over it with my, not only my kids, I've got a seven-year-old, a five-year-old and a three-year-old. And I, I, I talk about this stuff with them. And I also go over it with my wife because I want her to be able to take care of my boys, you know, if they're hurt and I'm not around. Um, don't keep that information to yourself. You know, we want everybody to be as cross trained as possible. We all have our different skill sets, you know, especially within a family unit. But uh, you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows where that medical kit is. Um, you know, it's like a fire extinguisher. If you don't see it on a regular basis, you keep it down underneath your sink. When there's a fire, you might forget that you even have a fire extinguisher. So it's important to uh, to go over where it is and what's in the kit and then how to use the kit. Um, you know, I've through all these riots and stuff that we've seen, um, I've been I've been watching a lot of these medical situations that pop up. And not not too long ago, there's a young lady who took uh, took a bullet to the leg and she had a tourniquet on her and she didn't know how to put it on so it good on her for having the tourniquet but she obviously never bothered to actually try to use it and learn how to use it so uh, make sure that you know what you're using and, and why you're doing what you're doing yeah you know you you cover a couple of things i want to talk about training your kids because your kids may save your other kids life and i think that's an important thing but also don't want to, i don't want to for step over this like the three most important things to probably know how to use i want to talk about that um and then uh tourniquet let's talk we'll end up talking about that so if we, let's if i get sidetracked help me remember those things sure uh, but but first you know training your kids let's just you know i don't think that people realize that you may be the one who needs help and your kids the only one there to help you or something and and i think that that's a really important thing to train your kids so that you know, you all, we always think, I always think, I'm going to be the one that's protecting and taking care of my kids, but you never right. know when it's going to be the situation where I need that little guy to help me out. <laughs> yeah. um, so I do think that's important. And, and we talk a little bit about having a plan in place um, here. At least we talk about having a plan in place when an active shooter goes, you know, happens. And what do you do? And what does the mom do? What do the kids do? What do you do? And you should all be on the same page. You're not trying to figure that out. What's well, the same thing? probably should have a plan in place on uh, proceeding with medical. And you were talking about how the kids love it, right? And they feel like they're yeah. kind of a hero when they do it and save dad's life, you know, in these mock scenarios. Absolutely. I have a, so I got a YouTube channel where I talk a lot about this kind of stuff. And one of the videos that I did a little while ago is um, I filmed one of, uh, one of our safety meetings. And uh, so I mean, you don't have to get this crazy with it. You can still do a decent training with it. But I, I got a little fake wound that you'd expect to see for for uh, Halloween and some fake blood. And so I put the fake wound on my arm, poured all over a lot of the fake blood, and then I let them be the hero. You know, I just laid up against a tree and let them put the tourniquet on me and uh, and go over some of that stuff. And they just had such a good time with that they they want to be heroes you know um they they want to help people out too and giving them the knowledge the skills and the resources to do that is important and they're only five and seven years old and my five-year-old i showed him one time how to put on the tourniquet i coached him through it one time and then uh, i let him do it all by himself on the second time and he got it perfect which wow. really really surprised me because I've given plenty of classes to a lot of adults, you know, and and uh, they've struggled with it, and he was able to pick it up that quick, which is which is pretty cool. And not only that, but one of the things I wanted to 
investigate was could he put in enough pressure on the tourniquet to stop blood flow and i was surprised that yes he could um he could have saved my life if it if it had come down to it and of course this is something like all training just with us we have to revisit that with our kids you know we have to go back over it i need to go back over it with them and have them do it again and again and again until you know they get they won't ever get it wrong there you go so um just looking at some comments here what are some good resources people are talking about they need to get more training or oh, i need to do more training um training is important so um what can what do you guys providing these guys with for training well, we've got um, training resources on our uh, website at mountainmanmedical.com you can go and uh and find a training course that I put together earlier this year with uh, concealedcarry.com. Um, there's also the Stop the Bleed Foundation. They have a lot of really good um, resources there. You can go to um, the Red Cross. They've got their first aid programs. All important things to go and and uh, and to learn this stuff. If you wanted to get really crazy with it, it wouldn't be that big of a deal to go to a first responder course. Um, the um, you can find that at some of your local fire departments and and those types of places um, and that's a good way of staying on top of that training if you go to one of those like maybe once a year then you can do a lot of good for somebody who needs it yes for sure what are uh, some of the like top three items somebody should have and know how to use in your experience tourniquet's going to be obviously that number one um, and the reason for that is because that's what's probably going to kill people the fastest. Um, and it's the e most easily preventable, especially if you have a commercial made tourniquet on you. Now, I've, I've run into some people who say like, well, I'll just make my own tourniquet if it comes down to it. I'm not going to bother to carry medical equipment. And you can improvise a tourniquet. I've been trained on how to do that. Um, but it's not very effective, especially if you looked at a situation like the Boston bombing. They had quite a few people that were given improvised tourniquets. And from what I understand, none of them worked. So the combat application tourniquet, the CAT from North American Rescue, and then the soft T wide are generally the uh, industry standards when it comes to quality commercial made tourniquets. And they do the job great. Um, not only is do they um, are they really effective, but you're not having to spend time trying to make a tourniquet. It mm -hmm. takes some time, and I know how to do it, but it'll still take me a decent amount of time. And the whole time, that you know, they're bleeding out, so it's better to have a tourniquet on you. Right, and um, so people are asking them where can they get affordable medical kits and stuff like this. Well, this is the SWAT T that comes in the Yosemite uh, medical kit. We're going to give away a Yosemite kit, and we're going to give away um, the Sweetwater, I believe, kit we're giving away. It, it's the Yellowstone and the Sweetwater. Oh, what did I have? Yeah, I'm sorry, Yosemite Parks. Come on. I, I was close. Um, <laughs> but this has the, uh, the directions right on the tourniquet, so that's pretty cool, too, if you are in that situation you're trying to remember what to do. And I love that um, it can – it's – made available to open very easily from pretty much anywhere on the package right there i don't know if you can see those little things um how you just rip into them really really easily on pretty much everywhere on the packaging but um so people are wanting to know where can they get affordable medical kits yeah mountainmanmedical.com that's the place to get them out uh, i'm pretty proud of the prices that we have um, like a big stipulation for me being involved with this company was being able to help as many people as possible and I, I'm really proud of the price point that we have. It's extremely competitive. There's few people out there, if any, who are, are putting out quality medical kits like we have um, at the price point that we have. Yeah, so. and, I, and I just want to say that they're going to even make you happier right now because if you use the promo code AGH1515, you're going to save 15%. So I would encourage you to go check it out once we end this show and uh, get yourself one of these kits and then we can look at getting training. We're going to hopefully get Brian back more. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be here for a while, but I'm just saying in the future, um, you could have these out during one of these shows and you could practice with us while we're using these things in a scenario. So uh, I want to continue because there's lots of questions here, but um, we talked about number one, having a tourniquet. Number two, what would be your number two on the top three things to have and know how to use? Uh, I really like the the quick clot, the combat gauze, um, that's pretty, 
that's that's one of those essential things. Uh, since bleeding can kill you so quickly, we want to make sure that we have not only redundancy, but the ability to treat multiple types of injuries. And not every injury is going to be, you know, arterial blood and not all of it's going to need a tourniquet. So you want to have options available uh, to use if it's if it's still bleeding badly, but not badly enough that you need a tourniquet. And the quick clot is a good way to do that. You can pack wound. You just cram as much of that quick clot in there as you possibly can. What I like to do is roll that gauze up into a nice little ball. We call the power ball. And the idea is you want to poke that power ball down as close into contact with that artery as you can possibly get. And what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to put an additional amount of pressure right up against that artery to get it to seal off. Then the quick clot is impregnated with a hemostatic agent. So it's got a blood clotting agent in the gauze itself to help seal off that wound. I've used that in Afghanistan and the, the, the people that I used it on, they, they wound up surviving. So in my experience, it's a good thing. Um, so I really like to have that. And then I would say my third thing would be chest seals, especially for that penetrating trauma and those chest injuries. That's going to be a pretty good thing for you. So what we have right here is uh, exactly what he's talking about. Quick clot and chest seals, which are also available. You can buy these individually right now. You can also use that promo code AGH15 as well. And what I like about your packaging too, number one is it's uh, sealed. So you don't have to worry. This is all going to be um, sterile. So, uh, and then to have these little orange tabs, which tells you basically look here, peel here, even on these ones too. I like that it's very easy to know where do you need to peel in that situation. Um, and then obviously we've got a couple kits we're gonna give away, but stay tuned, we're not giving them away right this second. Um, so, uh, there, there, man, there's so many things I wanna talk about. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just get right into it because I, I know that you and I have uh, some things in common, lots of things in common. Um, but um, I think you and I both feel what's what's really uh, there's so many things it's hard for me to get it out but there's a lot more that's important than just being trained with and having the medical supplies and having them on you and I hope that everybody uh, does carry something around I always have something on me no matter where I'm at um, I think you know we do this stuff to be prepared right we talk about being prepared um, for for something that takes place and uh, and I think that part of the preparedness is something you can't prepare for because you don't know the situation. But I know what's close to Brian and what's close to myself, as you guys know, um, is what can occur during these things. And I don't think that a lot of us are prepared for this. And it maybe it might sway you from making that decision at a certain time. But you know, Brian, maybe you can speak from wherever you want or however you want. But there, you know, there is. Um, there, there's these events that you show up to, and um, it's they're not pretty usually uh, when you're when you're involved with something like this. And um, like I was saying earlier, the the instance can occur for 10 seconds, and then what happens that next hour or two hours or week or year or years can be more powerful, I think, than um, what happened in that second. You know, and um, and, and is there a way to I guess we're talking about medical training and how do you heal people, right, and help people. And I think there's probably people here joining us today and um, who may need some other type of um, healing from this traumatic event. And, and Brian can speak a lot on this. Um, what, you know, Brian, in your professional opinion, and, and I know that you've seen some things, been through some things, and you don't need to share if you don't want to. Um, and I know uh, you've found some things that are helpful for you when you've come onto these situations that are not easy to witness, especially if you've never seen it before. You know, um, what, for those people that are out there watching, what is some advice you give them if they end up finding themselves in a situation where it's it's not uh, it's not pleasant? You know, how do you deal with the aftermath of that? Right. Yeah. I, this is kind of a question I get on a fairly regular basis. I, a couple of years ago, I was given a class. Uh, I used to uh, do some consulting for uh, active shooter scenarios for uh, faith-based organizations. And uh, uh, on a fairly regular occasion, I would have somebody that would come up to me after the class and ask me, how do you deal with the blood? And um, 
And at first, I was kind of like, what do, you, what do you mean? I mean, you have to. I mean, for me, especially, you know, that's my job. I, you know, the, that's what's expected of me. And so I just kind of assumed that I, I would just have to deal with it. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I kind of realized that there was, uh, I, have, I have little techniques that I've developed over the years when I am and involved in an emergency. And I, I started to think back on some of these techniques that I, I used personally, and it's kind of helped me to see things in a, in a different light. And one of the things that I think is generally what happens the most when someone asks me this question is that they see themselves failing. They see themselves that when they imagine themselves in a scenario where there's a lot of blood and everything is count and that person is counting on them to save the life, they see themselves not being able to handle it. Um, you know, maybe they pass out from the blood or maybe they see themselves being panicked and not knowing what to do and can't find their tourniquet and that kind of stuff. And something that's helped me over the years is seeing myself succeed. I'm not going to set myself up for failure by imagining myself in a dangerous and emergent situation and seeing myself fail. I'm going to see myself being the best medic that ever walked the face of this earth. And Obviously, that's not true. There's way better medics out there than me. But I'm going to handle that situation with the amount of confidence that would come from somebody who's the best medic in the world. And I see myself succeed. I see myself taking care of that person and, and helping them get to the hospital and seeing a surgeon. So I'm already setting myself up for success that way. The other thing that you're going to do is get the training. A lot of what panic comes from is not knowing what to do and not being confident in the skills that you have. So if you go to the training, you learn all this stuff, and then you learn how to take care of somebody, you just do that stuff. And that's all that's expected of you. And that takes care of uh, a decent amount of the panic aspect. Then there's also something to be said for experience. And that's a lot more difficult to get um, because you have to be in emergency after emergency after emergency until you get enough experience to be able to handle pretty much any situation. So a way around that is scenarios. And back in the day, they used to call it daydreaming, you know, um, and you see yourself in this situation. You imagine what it's like to have a casualty with a femoral artery bleed or a sucking chest wound. Walk through the steps in your own mind. What, what happens if I see this? What are my first steps? You walk through that in your own mind before it happens, you're going to jump right into the situation and you're going to handle it because you've already th thought about it a thousand times. And not every situation is going to be the same, but there, there's a good chance it's going to be pretty similar. And you'll be able to have that line in the sand drawn already and you won't even have to think about it. You'll just react. And that's helped me quite a few times. Uh, I know when I was in Afghanistan, we would be out on patrol. Um, occasionally, I could feel my mind wander, start thinking about home and and that kind of thing. And what I would what I would routinely do is check myself. I I would snap myself out of thinking about home, and I would pick my head up and I would look around me, and I would think to myself, if something happened right now what would I do? Where would I establish my casualty collection point? How would I treat those injuries? Um, and I found that it that helped me out quite a bit. And then um, afterwards, once you start getting more into the, um, it, it gets kind of hard afterwards, especially. Um, you, after you've been in that situation, you think about it a lot. And um, a lot of people could have PTSD. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely normal process. Back in the day, they used to call it uh, warrior's heart, shell shock. Um, and that's back when they didn't understand it. And back then, our warriors thought that you were weak if you had PTSD. And nowadays, we're learning that there's probably, <laughs> there might be something wrong with you if you don't have PTSD. Um, so it's a very common thing and it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, I know I spent a decent amount of time after the military working with veterans um, for disability claims. And I got, a, I got the opportunity to talk with them about their personal experiences and share my personal experiences. 
and I learned that we weren't that different. Uh, you know, we, we had completely different experiences, but those experiences and how it affected us years later were fairly similar, almost to the point of being exactly similar. And um, one of the big things I'm always trying to impress on my veterans or my first responders who have who, who might have PTSD or have gone through a traumatic event is you're not alone. Everybody goes through this and there are, you can get better. Um, I've, I've run into Vietnam veterans who are still struggling with their PTSD and they haven't gotten a handle on it because they didn't even know one that they were injured, that this is an injury that you have to recover from, but also that you can recover. And talking that stuff out with somebody that you trust and respect is a great way of working through those particular issues, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, that's well said, man. Thank And uh, to all you out there, veterans who've served, thank you, first of all. And uh, thank you, Brian, as well. And uh, it, it, there, are, there are lots of things that you could do to help, and, not, and it's not an overnight success, period. Uh, it just takes time. And uh, there's a lot of people out there willing to listen and take the time to listen to you. And, and uh, you know, I found that you just, amongst people, the more you talk about it, this is my, my own thing, was the more you talk about it, the easier it is to talk about it and the easier it is and quicker it is to get over uh, whatever it may be that you're experiencing. Now, look, a lot of you who are here know that I like the use PTS, I drop the D, hashtag drop the D, right? Um, it's not a disorder because it is a real thing and it's a naturally occurring thing. And I don't care if you're a, a mom who lost a child or if you're a man who lost a child or whatever it may be, you uh, go through some sort of, there's an experiment, an experience that's traumatic, whatever it may be. Maybe you came up on a rolled over vehicle with some teenagers in it or something and there's a traumatic event that triggers something inside of us as humans and the way that our brain works and this is a completely normal way to react it's just how it happens um and so it's not to get caught up with there's something wrong it's not a disorder and and uh, and i understand why it's called this i understand that but i uh, I, I love the uh, drop the d it's it's uh, it's a completely normal thing and uh go ahead oh, sorry well PTS or PTSD, as it's more commonly known, is a survival tactic um, mm. because what it's doing is it's making you hyper vigilant. Um, mm. And the more hyper vigilant you are, the less likely you are that that danger, that same danger that puts you in in distress to begin with, is going to catch you off guard. So one of the biggest things that I've seen is that hyper vigilance, making sure all the doors are locked excessively. Um, one of the things that I really struggled with is just going to Walmart or any grocery store and standing in line to buy groceries and not being able to watch the person in front of me and the person behind me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was, I finally had to realize that um, John Lovell, uh, one of my uh, personally favorite people, um, he, he talked a little bit about how he used to do that as well, where he would look at everybody as being a legitimate threat. Um, and that's not a healthy way to go about life. It might be a healthy way to go about life if you're in a combat zone, but if you're not in a combat zone, that can be very detrimental to you. Um, I. I had a, a particular problem where um, I would go to Walmart with my wife. She wanted to go buy some things and I would go into the store with her. And while I was in there, I was looking at where all of the threats were coming from constantly. I never sat with my back to the door. I always knew where my exits were. And anytime that door opened, I was mad dogging everybody that would come in, that would come in. You know, everybody was a threat to me. And something John Lovell said is, that's that's poor tactics. You don't look at everyone like they're a threat. Is that 95 year old grandmother going to whip out a Glock and cap you in the head? Probably not. Is that is that worth expending your time and energy to watch her like a hawk? No. If anything, you should be looking for a more legitimate threat. 
And um, a lot of the times, especially with some of these uh, these veterans that I've run into who have extreme PTSD, they get sent to or they volunteer to go to a um, to a program where they live at this program and they start learning tactics for helping their mind recover. And one of the things that they do is they have these veterans go through a little checklist in their mind. And your mind sometimes will tell you this situation is a 10. I am 100% convinced that I will be attacked at any second. But in reality, it's more like a one, you know, and being able to disassociate yourself and realize that this situation feels like a 10 because your mind is injured. But the situation really is more of like a one, probably more like a zero. And being able to um, to make your mind change that way helped me a lot. Um, I started making those little changes on my own. Um, and then once I started running into veterans who have been going through these these very intense rehabilitation programs where they were teaching that, I was I was surprised to find that this is a technique that they're actually teaching. And it's something that really helped me to get past my PT, my PTS and, 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 and start to recover. Yeah, man. I'm sorry. I don't even know if there's any questions. I haven't been looking at comments or anything. I'm just, just listening here. And, uh, and well, so, uh, I, <laughs> if, uh, if anybody has questions, I'm, I'm an open book. I don't mind talking about any of my experiences. I went through, you know, some rough times and, um, and it, it, while the war itself, I nearly died like maybe 10, 15 times when I was in Afghanistan. But the thing that almost killed me was the PTSD when I got back. You know, I, it nearly destroyed me. And I was very fortunate to have a good support structure around me. And, um, and if it wasn't for that, I might not have ever recovered. And uh, I know there's a lot of guys out there that don't have that same support structure. And that's why you got to go find it. You got to you got to make yourself do it because it's worth it. You can get past this. Absolutely, bud. Man, thank you for sharing that, and thank you uh, for sharing your heart, man. That's that's one thing I love. Me and Brian sitting here talk. We could talk on the phone for freaking hours. And um, and one thing that I love about Brian is his heart, man. He just you just you got an amazing heart, man. And thank he's you. doing so many good things, you guys. He's doing so many good things. He's doing beyond this. He has the experience to be able to help people with the medical side, but he's doing so many more cool things. And I love that we can help support you. And I'm so glad that you took the time to be here today. And, um, you know, I'm sure he uh, would love to hear from you guys as well. So anybody, if you need somebody to talk to, I'm, I know he he's all ears too. And, you know, we're talking about how you help people who are injured. You know, we're talking about these kids, quick clot, and tourniquets and i think that um people always want to get trained and all that but what can i do let's talk about how you can help somebody who needs help you know brian maybe you can guide them on like what can you do you know you said about having a support group what can what can we do what can we do yeah so i think um veterans especially you know they um they feel like no one knows what they're going through and I cannot tell you how many veterans I've talked to over a huge range of generations who have experienced almost the exact same symptoms. Um, but still, they feel like they're the only ones that have ever experienced this and they don't want to talk about it. And a lot of it is very painful. You know, the, the exact experiences that cause the trauma are very painful to relive. Um, so everyone is different uh, for me I, i've never really had a very large problem with that i'm not sure why um, but i i i don't have a problem talking about my experiences but some people do um, and that's why it's important to find people that you respect and that have gone through similar experiences one of the the great resources is uh, a veteran service organization like um, AMVETS. That was one that um, I helped with a lot. Uh, they've got clubs set up all over the place. Uh, the American Legion, the VFW, uh, 
going and seeing some of these places and interacting with some of the veterans that make up some of these clubs helps a lot. There's a reason why these clubs exist, and, and a big reason is because it's a place for veterans to hang out with other veterans and to feel like they're in a safe place. If they say something that sounds extremely wrong, you know, to, to a civilian that might sound really calloused and cold and dark, but you know, the other veterans who have gone through something like that will recognize it. And you, you know, you won't be as judged is generally the idea. And uh, this, this stuff works. Um, the other part is um, not drinking. Stay away from alcohol. In my opinion, like it makes everything worse. And when you're in the middle of, you know, the darkest of your times, it feels like it's going to help, but it will not. Yeah, um, it actually prolongs your healing. So every well, day that you drink, it actually will take another day longer. And it just keeps compounding. So you'll never actually start to heal. Um, it, and I love what you said. It feels like it. It feels like it. You're covering up. And what's, I think part of the hardest thing dealing with PTSD is having to feel it and having to experience it. And you just have to do it to get through it. And um, uh, not to get into too many details, but uh, when, you know, when I, I had an experience and when I went into this situation and and I resorted to whatever I was doing um, to, to cover up the feelings, right? I mean, that's really essentially what's going on. And, uh, and you think that you're numbing it, but in hiding it and covering up, but you're not, you're prolonging that experience. And, and um, you're absolutely right. And I think that's part of the hardest thing. One of the hardest things is uh, to find way to, is that you just got to put on your armor and feel it, man. You got to take it on. You got to just, you just got to take it on. And that's hard. I think for me, that's the hardest part is uh, just feeling it because, and, and, you know, society, I think for me, I feel, Want you to be a man and be strong and you shouldn't have emotions and you shouldn't break down and you shouldn't feel this certain way but that's a bunch of crap you know like your uh, your body's reacting and that's the way it's reacting um you know and there's there's all sorts of levels and all people deal with it differently and uh so there's no correct answer but i i do agree with you on the alcohol and drugs stay away from them they're going to um prolong it and not make it any better they're probably gonna make it worse to be honest with you absolutely i know from my personal experience <clears throat> when i feel threatened i get angry you know i get aggressive i get you know i i kill everything in my in that general direction kind of a thing and when you have ptsd it's because you feel like there's a one of the things about PTSD is it makes you feel like you're constantly have a threat around you. And so what I found was that I was angry all the time about everything. And I was always looking for an outlet for that aggression because I didn't realize that it was my brain counteracting that feeling of the threat. So my wife and I would go to like a, a grocery store and the whole time, I'm looking for that threat coming and and I'm watching her also like you know look at shirts and look at pants and I'm thinking to myself what is taking so long like for crying out loud just pick a shirt you know <laughs> and and I would get mad at her and she'd be looking at me like what what is going on like I'm just looking at a shirt and what I started to do is I started to impose my anger my discomfort my anxiety on her i didn't realize that i was mad at the situation i was mad because of all of these threats i thought were coming at me and so it would start these big fights but once i realized that i'm not mad at her i'm just uncomfortable in this situation because my mind is a little screwed up right now you know and um and that helped me a lot and then i was also talking with her and explaining I'm just feel really uncomfortable right now. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to yell at you. You know, I'm just feeling really uncomfortable. And she said, well, maybe you should go wait in the car. And I was like, yeah, maybe I'll go wait in the car, you know? Um, so being able to get past that rage 
is important. Uh, and uh, I know as it gets easier, the more you do it. The first time you do it, you try to get rid of that rage. It's hard. It's so hard. And then, but once once you let it go, you just feel it drop off your shoulders, man. Like it's been a pack and you've been on a ruck for, you know, for 15 hours and you just drop that off. And the next time it's a little easier, not, not much easier, but a little. And the next time it's just a little easier and, and you just have to work on it. You have to train yourself to get comfortable with letting that rage go. And that, that really helped me out quite a bit. Yeah. You know, and, and one thing that I think is really important, this is probably, I think one of the most important in that situation when you're in it, and you were talking earlier about talking yourself out and telling you you're going to fail and you're not going to be able to do it. Your mind is the most powerful thing that you have that you're equipped with is the best tool that you can ever use. And when you uh, start to go down a negative spot, you can go down negative fast and it's really hard to go back up. And it takes Mm -hmm. a lot more work and energy to, to get back up than how fast you can go down. And in that situation, when you're in it, you need to stay positive because that's really going to help you in that situation and I, uh, and I strongly believe that even after because I think there's days where you feel hopeless and you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel or you don't think that you can get through it or you know there you, you feel hopeless and you have to resort to the mind power to tell yourself that it does and it will because whatever you're saying inside of you what you're telling yourself your head is the most important thing and I, you have to trust me on this it really is and I have situations where as soon as I started to go negative and I start to go down that slippery slope, it would be like 100 miles an hour and I'd have to slam the brakes, slam it because, man, you can go so far, so fast and try to build yourself up and it would take 100 times longer to get back up. But if you just keep that positive mindset, you will get through it. And, and one day at a time, it takes one day at a time, you get through the day and then every day becomes a, a beautiful day. You know, like uh, you have things to look back and to compare to and, and uh, see where you're at now and where you're going and where you've come from. And so I think you got to keep that in mind. It's, it's your mind is the strongest weapon that you have. And uh, just use it and use it the right way. Use it effectively. Don't use it the wrong way. Don't take yourself down the wrong avenue. Stay strong. Absolutely. I think... One of the things that helped me a lot was when I would be in these extremely dark times and it feels like it feels like it's going to be like that forever and that there's no hope. And don't listen to that because that is an absolute lie. You will smile again. You will have fun again. You will love again. You you just have to give it time and you just stay at it. Don't don't let yourself fall into that trap that this is never going to change and that I'm going to be like this forever. Be oh, the man. person that you want to be. Absolutely, man. I have to just go right off of that. I love this conversation. This is a conversation. Brian, I could talk for hours about this nope. stuff. So, so sorry, we're, we're kind of just taking today and, and just being passionate. One of the things he says is give it time. And I want to share a story um, that was shared with me too. And, uh, you know, time does heal everything, you know, and there's a certain individual, you know, I was going through a, a moment and I was given this piece of information and and um, there was an individual who was struggling with certain things and there was alcohol involved and uh, rage was going on and he ended up uh, not being able to control it one evening it was one evening that he couldn't control it and he unfortunately that was his last evening but if he could have made it through that night six months down the road he probably never even would have remembered what that night you know, he would have gone past it. Life would have went on, but he couldn't get it through that night. And um, I, I remember being told like, hey, if he would have just given it a day, a week, six months, a year, two years, you know, that event that he was dealing with in that moment would have passed, you know, and, and it, all it took was, was some time. And uh, so you're absolutely right, man. Time does heal. Time definitely heals. Just give it some time. One day absolutely. at a time. Yep, you can get better. You just have to work at it. It takes a little effort, but it is worth it, in my opinion. Yep. I I, I, I want to apologize because we got sidetracked, but I don't either want to apologize because I think it's exactly where we needed to be in this moment. And I 
Now, I, I will say that, Brian, we're going to have you back, uh, and we can answer some of these questions, too. I know we're getting closer to the end of the hour, which has gone by so fast. It's just what happens, I guess. Uh, and I know that we're still – people uh, are wanting these medical kits because they've been asking about them. And uh, so let's let's just take a brief moment to pause and, and – uh, Let's talk about these medical kits because I know that um, people here want to know about them. So we've got a couple of uh, the um, Yellowstone um, kit is available right now and also the Sweetwater. And maybe you could just give a real quick brief breakdown of those because we've got about five minutes left here and and uh, tell them and then we'll pick a winner. Yeah, so uh, I got the uh, Yellowstone kit here. Uh, it's a nice little size. Um, I like uh, the size that it is because you can get it into a backpack, you put it behind your car and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it's got everything in it that you'd need to take care of at least one person, if not more people, if you need to. Um, again, the training is super important. If uh, you don't have any training, but you buy a medical kit, pry won't do you a whole lot of good. So make sure that you know how to use the stuff that's in it. Um, inside of the kit, um, all the kits come stock with a, uh, a SWAT T, which is a tourniquet. It's an elastic bandage, so it just stretches. Like you might see, like one of those um, uh, the workout bands, right? And it just stretches around and it compresses the arteries and and uh, and it'll occlude blood flow. The thing about them, though, is that uh, they're not recommended or they're not supported by the TCCC committee. And the TCCC committee is a government organization that's been stood up to um, look at these life-saving devices for the use of combat. And in combat, you're gonna be doing a lot of things that you probably might not do in a civilian setting, or at least not nearly as much, like drag your casualty over a wall and through a field. And the cat tourniquets and the soft T-wides are are great tourniquets because not only do they occlude the, the arteries, but they stay in place pretty good. Now you always wanna make sure that you're checking the tourniquets to make sure that they haven't come loose and that they're still doing what they're supposed to, but there's a, they're probably gonna stay in place. So you don't have to worry about them quite as much. The SWAT T, uh, you just tuck it under itself so it doesn't secure quite as well. So you wanna be double checking it to make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to, especially if you're dragging them around. Um, but this is a good, cheap option. It's also a multi-use option. You can use this as a pressure dressing, um, as a sling. You can use it to um, set up a splint. You're, it's only limited by your, your imagination. So I like making sure that you include this. We don't offer the cat tourniquet. That's, a op, that's an upgrade. So we do offer the cat tourniquet, but it's an upgrade. And I really recommend that everybody go for the upgrade. But to try to keep the kit um, a more manageable price line so that everybody can have it, uh, we decided to go with uh, this included just as it's stocked. And then, of course, you know, the cat tourniquet to, um, uh, to uh, do more of the uh, bleeding control. We've got the uh, North American Rescue ETD. That's a pressure dressing. This is a small, flat, compact. You can see how uh, thin it is. So it fits in the kit pretty well. We've got two pairs of gloves, which is kind of important to me. Uh, in my experience, especially during an emergency when you might be kind of panicked and trying to get gloves on, there's a good chance you might rip them. So having a backup pair of gloves is is nice because you know, you're trying to force your hand into this glove. Your hands are all sweaty and you're tense and you just rip right through it. At least you got a backup pair for that. And, and then if you have somebody that's helping you out, you got a pair for them as well. We've got trauma shears got to expose that wound. We've got a permanent marker so that you can record the time that your tourniquet was placed, take notes, anything else that you need it for. We've got uh, sterile gloves, ace wraps for more bandages, um, the hyphen chest seals. We have two of these in there because again, like I already said, you got to patch the front and the back hole. Um, you don't always have an exit hole, exit wound. So um, having them individually packaged like this, you can just tear one off, patch the front wound, there's no back wound. So then you just keep the other chest seal, put it back into your kit, manage your resources. Being Part of being a good medic is being able to manage your resources uh, for when, um, 
uh, when you don't have enough resources, you want to make sure you're, you're able to uh, extend those for as long as you can. So, and they all come in this uh, nice little pouch. I, uh, I I made sure that we got the uh, the upgraded zippers. That's usually what fails on me on all of my kit. Every time I use my stuff in an austere environment, the zippers go first. So, um, and that's the Yellowstone kit. And you can find this on mountainmanmedical.com. I also got a YouTube channel where I talk about all of this kind of stuff. If this is uh, something that you're interested, you want to brush up on, uh, head over to uh, YouTube at the mountainmanmedical.com website, or sorry, YouTube Mountain Man Medical channel. And uh, I, I go over all of this stuff, and you can see a little bit more about what's in each one of the kits. So that's all I got. Hey, uh, quick, quick question. Are there expiration dates on these supplies that come in these kits? Yes, especially with medical equipment. Um, I think uh, these things will uh, expire after about five years or so. And then there's also the problem where if you might have to use this stuff to take care of somebody or yourself, uh, you might be able, you're going to want to replace all that stuff. So we have refill kits available on mountainmanmedical.com. And uh, so if you use anything, let us know. We'll ship you a new, uh, some, uh, some ref refill stuff for it. And uh, again, right now, go check out. After this show, we got three minutes left. And then go there. Use the promo code AGH15. It'll save you 15%. So why would you not take advantage of that right now? Go check it out. Uh, so we've got about two or three minutes left. We Two minutes left. We need to pick uh, winners. We're going to get you the Sweetwater kit right now um and you're just gonna have to direct messages here to alien game we're gonna get you a yellowstone kit as well thank you guys all for tuning in today we certainly appreciate it i hope you could take something away from this show brian i can't thank you enough man not only for being here today and coming back in the future but for uh, your sacrifice that you've made for all of us and for all of our brothers and sisters who are overseas uh, fighting for our freedoms and you putting yourself there and paying a price whatever price that is that you had to pay you paid it and you hopefully are not having to pay that price anymore and you're able to heal and move on but thank you for the sacrifice seriously it means so much to us and to it makes it's what makes america the greatest country on the planet is men like you who will be brave and have the courage to go out and uh be selfless so thank you man really appreciate thank it Thank you. I appreciate that. It, it was my honor. So let's do it. Let's, uh, Riley, Brendan, can you pick a couple of names we're going to give away these kits to real quick? Yes, we can. Hey, uh, actually, I just saw a message here from a guy named Andrew D. Myers. Says, I will need to know uh, we can get refills. Yes, you can. Andrew D. Myers, I think, happened to be here earlier today in the facility. He was cruising on in and spending some time in the area it's nice to meet you today andrew thank you for tuning in uh thank all of you for tuning in by the way we certainly appreciate it we wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for you so uh the more you guys keep showing up and doing these things the more we get to do this stuff so i i certainly appreciate it i've enjoyed it so uh yeah here we go we're gonna right here it is who's it gonna be the first we're gonna give away the sweet water kit too is that it Right there, Larry Crane Newcomer. Larry Crane Newcomer. You need to direct message us on our Facebook page. We're gonna give you a code. We're gonna hook you up with one of those Sweetwater kits and then we're gonna give away right now the Yellowstone, better known as Nate's Yosemite kit. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan Beller. Uh, Morgan Beller, thank you for tuning in. You got yourself the kit as well. I don't know. Brian and I are going to have to discuss when we can have you back. I can't wait to have you back, man. Um, I had a blast. So whenever I can get on, I'm happy. Yeah, man. Let's do it next time. I think what we could do is we can actually get some of these products out and actually show them how you actually use them or something like that. We could do something like that. If you guys are all up for that, give us a like, will you? Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll just see how you go. If you've enjoyed this show, if you've enjoyed the content and enjoyed having Brian as a guest, please share this video and then uh, we'll be able to have him back and do more cool things like this because I love it. I love these shows, man. Thank you, man. Seriously. Had a blast. Thank you. We'll talk soon. There's one last thing that I need you guys to do for me here. Please. Carry safe. Carry in comfort. Carry on.